Greetings, and bienvenue, mine crew. Thank you for returning to this broadcast. And welcome to new viewers joining us for the first time. If you like a video, then feel free to subscribe. So I have a few weird stories about the Indian reservation back home I'd like to share. The area my stories take place is known as the Bottoms or the Water Babies. A little bit of background before I get into it all. The Snake River that runs all through Idaho and some of it goes through the reservation. One particular part of it is where these stories will take place. The story that I got told in high school was that back in the day when the natives would have two kids they would take them down to the river and hold them under the water and whichever one didn't die got to go home. I have no idea if this is true or not, I haven't done any research on it, but that's the story. Kids would tell me that you see and hear strange things out there, basically general creepy stuff. My first time out at the Water Babies I was hanging out with some friends driving around and suggested we should go check it out. I had never been and I've always been interested in paranormal stuff. So, we drive out to the spot. Pull off to the left side of the road so that we're about in the center of the horseshoe shape and pick related. Where we are sitting we're about 100 or so feet from the water. We sat in the car watching the water for a few minutes waiting for spooks to happen. My friend next to me in the back seat asks if any of us saw that. Saw what? Says he thought he saw someone walk from the field on one side of the road towards the water a little bit in front of us. Whatever man, probably just seeing shit or trying to scare us. Keep watching the water. Start seeing white lights rise up from the water and float just on top. At first just one, then two, then three. One would go down and another would pop up somewhere else. Seemed like they were watching us. Out of nowhere my friend riding shotgun starts yelling at my friend to start the car and leave. I start looking around for headlights thinking a car is coming. The last thing I want is to get stopped by a res cop for parking on a road with the lights off and end up in the reservation jail as a small white kid. I don't see any car lights coming from anywhere. I look over my left shoulder towards the water and I finally see what my friend is yelling about. There is a huge black mass moving up the hill towards the car. It was a clear night, a ton of stars were out but I couldn't see anything behind this cloud. It looks like it's about 20 feet wide and 10 feet tall and it's moving fast towards us. My buddy driving finally starts the car and in a hurry shifts down and stomps on the gas and we don't go anywhere. I looked at the shifter and realized we were not moving because we were in neutral. Fantastic. I look back at the black cloud and it's just about on top of us. My friend riding shotgun shifts into first gear. We peel out for a second throwing gravel into the scary Indian demon cloud spirit's face and make our getaway after we finally calm down we start to laugh about it. We all go to a friend's house to play some video games. After the first time out there I'd go back about once every few weeks when I got bored. Never by myself though. It was scary but it was fun at the same time. Sometimes when we would go out nothing would happen, we wouldn't see or hear anything. This is the next time I remember that really stands out in my mind. Head back out to the bottoms with friends. Two car loads of people, about ten of us. By this time we would get out of the car to get a better look at the water. Never got too far away from the road though. I also noticed that when we got out of the car we could hear weird stuff. Would hear something crying out in the bushes. And would also hear what sounded like someone throwing large rocks into the water. That splash sound you get when you drop something big into the water. All of us are standing around watching the lights in the water when someone yells at the car. I turned around and sure enough there were headlights and red and blue lights coming for us. We all book it to the cars, most of us all pile into one car. Start to take off and the cop is right behind our friend's car that is behind us. He stops the car, I'm guessing because we were already fucked and he didn't want to get into a chase with the cops. Waiting in the car for the cop to come talk to us and probably get cited for something. He's talking to the kids in the other car for a few minutes and finally starts coming towards the car I'm in. While he's walking the twenty or so feet between us the whole time he's keeping his mag light oriented down towards the water. Which I thought was odd. He talks to us basically says he could sight us but isn't going to. Being chill as fuck. He asks what we're doing out here and we tell him we're dumb high school kids just trying to get scared. He's about to let us go when my friend asks if any of the stuff we've heard about the place is true. I forgot to mention that he is a reservation cop, but he just kinda looks at us for a second and says there is some weird stuff out here. We fuck off, and stay away for a while. The last time I went out was just before I signed up and was going to basic training a few weeks later. Since I was leaving soon I was doing as much partying as possible. A few times I ended up losing everything I had in my pockets. So to prevent myself from losing my car keys I put a carabiner on them and I would clip the carabiner to my pocket. 
that will come up again later. Drinking with my friend Brandon, Tom and some guy Tom knows named Steve. He was a super strange metal head. I suggest we get to the bottom again. Everyone is down, grab some beers and jump in Tom's car. Brando lives out on the reservation and knows the area a little better than we do. He's not native but his parents have property out there. He says we should check out a different spot down the road from the horseshoe spot that's right next to the water. Fuck it might as well. Go to a new spot and get out of the car and immediately start seeing the white balls of light. They almost look like alligator eyes when they get hit with a floodlight. There's tons of them, all over the place, all seem to be looking at us. Very strange vibes tonight. It felt very weird being this close to the water. Metalhead Steve says fuck this, in going in the water. He makes it two steps into the river and something about 50 feet from us splashes through the water up onto the bank and starts hauling ass through the bushes towards us. We freak out, run to the car and drive back to Tom's house. We get back and everyone decides to call it a night. I go to my car, reach for my keys, feel my carabiner. But no keys. I had never had any issues with my keys once I started using the D-ring. Fuck my life, some ghost kid stole my car keys. Since losing shit happened a lot before this, I had a spare key in a magnet box underneath the driver door. Drive back out to where we were at by myself. Pull up to the spot and I can see my keys shining in my headlights. I make it a point not to look at the water, if I see anything I might not have the balls to get my keys. Pull up to them, unlock the car, jump out, grab them, jump back into my car. Lock the doors, and quickly leave. Make it about 20 minutes down the road and look for my phone to see what time it is. Son, of, a bitch. The phone was on my lap when I jumped out to get my keys. Drive back out. Same plan of action. This time I have to look around for a second before I see it. Get phone, go home, lay in bed, I'm done with ghosts for a while. That's about all I've got for that. I've been wanting to share this on here for a while and finally had time to sit down and write it all out. Hope you enjoyed it. I want to preface this by saying I've been away from X for a few years. Only recently came back because I'm finally in a stable living arrangement and I watch a lot of conspiracy stuff for laughs. First story comes from a guy I met in Idaho in 2010 or 2011. Coworker invited me to his place for drinks. We'd been getting friendly because at the time I looked like a punk kid and he associated that with the metal he listened to. I didn't have any friends so I accepted. We made a quick stop on the way so he could pick something up from a guy. Follow him in because he doesn't object. A coworker. James walks right in, doesn't knock or anything. The homeowner is a weird dude named Simon. Absurdly well-dressed dude for someone that clearly doesn't leave the house except maybe to buy food and alcohol. We get to talking while James goes into some room for like 20 minutes. Simon works from home, apparently as a kind of secretary. Like arranging his business meetings and such, very rarely has to actually leave and would rather not anyway. He's got a bunch of mannerisms that suggested he wasn't all there. Like he'd start talking. Stop himself, tap his head with his fingers to some beat, then start talking about something different. James comes out of the room with a box and asks if I minded waiting there with Simon for a minute while he runs down to the end of the street to do something. Yeah sure whatever dude, I don't have anything better to do anyway. Simon asks where I'm from and that starts a long conversation about the differences between my hometown and his. Apparently he's originally from the greater Detroit area but moved to Idaho with his folks like a decade back and hasn't left since. James gets back like 20 minutes later while me and Simon are having a good time. He asks Simon if he wants to tag along for drinks. Simon asks us if we just wanted to drink at his place cause he might have to do some work during the night. Apparently he was just always on call. Later on, we're having a really good time. James turns out to be way smarter than me and he and Simon had a bunch of hey remember that time stories. I mostly don't have to talk about myself which is fine. Watching these two go on about old times was really fun. James starts asking me what I do to keep myself occupied since I moved out there. Tell him I mostly play video. We get on the subject of vampire fiction cause I'd just beaten vampire. The masquerade bloodlines for the first time. I opened it. Simon's really quiet the whole time. But since we'd killed a case of beer and gone out to get another 12 pack, I thought he was just out of his element. Say something about how the setting freaked me out. Because while I know none of it is real, it's totally plausible. Simon asks me how I know it's not real. Well because that's dumb. I'm pretty sure we'd know if there were vampires and gargoyles and shit. Simon starts telling me about this time he went urban exploring with some friends of his. I guess there wasn't much to do where he went to high school. There was like an old abandoned hospital or something. 
Way smaller than you'd think by the words abandoned hospital near his town that just wasn't torn down for some reason. It's all pretty cool to them. Lots of graffiti and stuff everywhere. No crazy homeless people. Lots of old paperwork and trash all over the place. Clearly used as a hangout spot some time ago. They get a lot of cool pictures, joke around a lot, and have a good time. Start getting the itch to do some more exploring. One of Simon's friends had heard about an abandoned mattress factory in a nearby city. They decide to go there the next day. Simon and his friends drive an hour out to this factory. Most of it is boarded up on the first floor so they have to break through a side entrance. The place stinks, but aside from a little bit of old graffiti it didn't seem like it had been touched in a decade or two. It's odd because the city it was in was kinda known as a shithole and you'd expect at the very least to find a squatter or two. They make their way through the building which is pretty big but mostly there was only the ground floor with a couple staircases that lead up to what Simon called offices raised up. Simon's looking through an office while his buddies are screwing around elsewhere. Smashing stuff and being dumbasses. Everything suddenly goes very dark and quiet. Simon freezes up. It's not like it gradually get darker or anything. And it's not his friends slowly stopped being dumbasses. It's more like a switch got flicked and everything changed. He pulls out his phone and uses the backlight to walk down the stairs and tries to go over to where his friends were. No sign of anyone. He walks around the building, calling out for them a few times. And decides fuck that, it's too weird in here, he's gonna wait outside for them. Goes to the side door they'd pride to get in. The plywood is back up, nailed in. He tries to keep a clear head but he's really freaked out. Keeps hearing a metallic tapping above him. Starts looking for something to break the plywood with. Since it wasn't that hard to do to get in, but they'd pried it off from the outside and now he'd have to actually smash through it. Metallic tapping is sounding more like skittering and getting louder as he moves through the building. Simon shuts the backlight of his phone off and tries to see where the noise is coming from. His eyes adjust, but it's damn near pitch black in the building and it's really hard to make out. But there's a spot that looks out of place in the corner above him. Looks like it's slowly moving, but Simon can't tell if it's just his eyes or the light conditions. Simon turns his phone's light back on and points it away from him, not looking away from the spot. The spot definitely moves. Simon said it looked like it was pretty big but not massive. He said every time he remembers it, he thinks of a couch-sized facehugger from Alien, but a lot slower. Simon eventually finds a really old fire axe next to a machine, walking slow as fuck and trying to balance speed with the amount of noise he was making. The axe would probably fall apart if he had to use it too much, but it would probably be good enough to knock a big enough hold in the plywood for him to get out. He moves back to the side entrance. That metallic tapping sporadically sounding like it was either right behind him or kinda far away. His phone's about to die. He starts smashing the axe into the plywood. Here's a noise he says he has no idea how to describe deeper in the building, like some cross between a car horn and a shout. Naturally. This motivates him to get the fuck out of there as quickly as he can. Eventually breaks the wood enough to work his way through. It's late as fuck. The clock on his phone which has been telling him it was still 2pm seems to be full of shit, considering the stars were out and streetlights on. His friend's car is gone. His phone calls won't go through. He walks a few blocks until he gets to a gas station and uses the clerk's phone to get a hold of his buddy. Apparently they'd looked for him for four hours. Blew his phone up and they started to get really freaked out so they left. Simon calls his folks and they pick him up. Simon has to get a new phone. His friends believe him, his parents think he's on drugs. A few days later they all decide to go back to the factory and check it out again. But stick together this time. They make the hour drive out there. Go round to the side door. Plywood is back up again. They pry it open again, look around, totally uneventful. They look through that old office Simon was in, nothing. One his buddy's phone rings. He answers it. Literally four seconds of audio. His phone restarts, some weird visual glitch occurs, and it just shuts off and won't start back up. They nope the fuck out of there. And never return. I don't really know where else to post this so here. When I was 17, I was going to stay with my uncle who owns a ranch in Idaho for the winter. My parents are older and are in their late 40s so my uncle, my dad's big brother, is close to 60 and more like a grandpa than anything. He's been married and divorced twice and has been living alone for almost my whole life. I live in Mesa, Arizona so the drive was fucking grueling. My uncle picked me up in October last year. He's super tall and a big-ass dude with a massive beard. He's pretty chill but really rough-looking. 
His ranch is in the middle of nowhere with no neighbors for miles. When I got there it was kind of exactly what I thought it would be. It's super old school run down looking. When driving and I noticed he had a long line of rocks lining the end of his property that were all painted white. I asked him about them and he told me he would tell me in a minute. As soon as we got in the house he told me there are rules when staying with them and if I broke them he would have no problem driving me all the way home. Said I couldn't go out any time after sundown without him under any circumstance. At night I needed to have my curtains drawn and all the lights off, and that if I needed a light I had to use a candle that he kept next to the bed. Then he took me outside and pointed out the white rocks. He said that the rocks went around the entire property and have been there even before he lived there. Told me to never ever go over the rocks or go anywhere far from the house without him. I was kinda spooked and asked why but all he said was there are always coyotes and they would kill me. The first night was fine except for the shitty bed. The next day he asked if I wanted to have fun and took me out back to shoot. A few weeks go by fine just hanging out having bonfires shooting and helping him on the property. End up getting into pretty decent shape helping him. Then in the middle of November we woke up to find a dead deer in the yard. My uncle flips his shit. Grabs me and puts me in the house and starts to lock the doors and windows up. Tells me to grab my shit and keep it near the door. I ask him what the fuck it's up. He doesn't tell me. Has me sleep in the living room on the pull-out couch while he sleeps in his chair. The next few days it's like he's a different person. Super paranoid and on edge. End up sleeping in the living room for a week till he chills and all is calm again. Thanksgiving comes around and he cooks up a turkey he had frozen and a bunch of other shit. We stuff ourselves and he even lets me have a few beers. We're chilling by the fire talking about the time he got into a fight with a guy over his ex-wife while listening to his old records when a shit ton of loud noises came out of nowhere. We both shoot up. He runs for the door. I follow after him and end up running full speed into the back of him and falling over. He had stopped at the door and started locking the locks. I thought he was running outside so I ran full speed. He tells me to grab his shotgun. I'm freaked out at this point because my massive badass of an uncle is freaking out. Loud ass sounds outside like barking, yelling and someone hitting a metal trash can all mixed. Then the window breaks. A massive rock was thrown through it. It was one of the painted white rocks. I'm freaking out now. My uncle shoots out the window. My ears are ringing and I'm crying at this point. He yells to grab the table and put it against the window. I put it against the window while he runs to his room. He comes back out with his rifle and hands it to me. Tells me if I see anything and do not hesitate to shoot it. I ask him if we should call the cops but he tells me they wouldn't be able to get to us for a few hours. All night we sit in the living room listening to whatever this thing is destroying the porch pound on the door. As soon as the sun starts to come up my uncle goes to the door and starts to unlock it. I start to freak out like what the fuck are you doing they are still there. He rips the door open and there's nothing there. I'm absolutely shitting my pants thinking of all the stories I've read about monsters, skinwalkers and other shit. The door is absolutely fucked. Super scratched up chunks missing. The porch has pieces missing and his truck has all the windows smashed and tires shredded. Looks like a bomb went off. My uncle looks around and sighs. I ask him what the fuck was that. He looks at me and tells me that there is a gang that comes around and does this kind of stuff to people's houses. Again, why are you lying to me? He tells me to shut the fuck up and relax. I don't believe him and I can see he's kicking himself for telling such a shitty lie. I go to take a picture of the door and outside and he grabs my phone and says no. I say what the fuck and he tells me if my mother saw what happened she would rip his balls off. He tells me to relax and it's okay. We clean up the porch and he has me help him replace his tires with a few old ones from the shed. We limp the truck back to town for him to get replacement tires and ask about the windows. Everyone in town is staring hard at us like we just drove into town in a clown car. It's a small town with a cafe and a diner, a gas station and mechanic, a general store and a motel. Everyone knows each other for the most part. The gas station clerk comes out and starts to talk to my uncle. The clerk and my uncle are talking quietly and I can see the clerk is upset. I overheard him say well what did you expect, it's getting worse man. Okay what the fuck. He takes me back to the house and tells me that the gang he was talking about was real but they are more like vandals and tweakers. 
I still don't believe him but act like I do. That night my uncle was surprisingly calm and told me they wouldn't come back two nights in a row. The night was calm except for this weird electric feeling in the air. Like the whole place would blow up if the littlest thing happened. I woke up really late to my uncle snoring in his chair. I had to piss super bad. The fire had died out so I used my phone light to make my way to the bathroom. The bathroom is super small with a tiny window at the top of the back wall behind the toilet. I get to the bathroom and turn the light on to piss. While I'm pissing I start hearing this weird noise. Like the tiniest scratching sound. I quickly realize it's coming from the window. Then it turns into tapping. I'm so terrified I'm just frozen there. If I wasn't already pissing I would be pissing my pants. Then I realize that I fucked up. I turn the light on when I'm supposed to be using a candle. I'm shaking. Then the window breaks and glass hits me. Screaming I back out of the bathroom passing all over my legs and pants. I didn't even look at the window. I just ran down the hall trying to pull my pants up. My uncle runs around the corner and grabs me. He yells what happened while I try to yell what happened. He sees the light on and runs to shut it off. He yells, I thought I made it clear about lights at night. Him crying digging through my duffel bag looking for new pants. The next day we leave and he drives me home saying it would be safer at home. Told me to not ever tell my parents because they would freak out. He stayed at the house with us for a few days and eventually we both chilled out again. I turned 18 this February and recently bought my first handgun and want to eventually go back and see if he will let me take pictures or set up a camera. Ringdakis is the name given to an unidentified animal shot by Israel Hutchins, a Mormon settler in Montana in 1886. Hutchins had it stuffed by a local taxidermist, Joseph Sherwood, who put it on display at his general store near Henry's Lake. Idaho until the 1980s when it mysteriously disappeared. DNA testing has never been conducted on the animal. In 2007, Jack Kirby, grandson of the man who shot the animal, tracked it down to the Idaho Museum of Natural History in Pocatello. The specimen was displayed in the Madison Valley History Museum when it reopened in May 2007. One winter morning my grandfather was aroused by the barking of the dogs. He discovered that a wolf-like beast of dark color was chasing my grandmother's geese. He fired his gun at the animal but missed. It ran off down the river, but several mornings later it was seen again at about dawn. The beast was also seen by others as it prowled around the homes and ranches of the area. Hutchins recorded the description as follows. Those who got a good look at the beast describe it as being nearly black and having high shoulders and a back that sloped downward like a hyena. The mysterious creature eluded the trigger-happy pioneers for a while, but finally its luck ran out. Then one morning in late January, my grandfather was alerted by the dogs, and this time he was able to kill it. Just what the animal was is still an open question. After being killed, it was donated to a man named Sherwood who kept a combination grocery and museum at Henry Lake in Idaho. It was mounted and displayed there for many years. He called it Ringdacus. Be me tonight. I was sitting in the passenger seat of a car with some friends driving on the way back from a road trip. We were on a freeway passing a college town in the desolate foothills of southeastern Idaho. It's about midnight and most of them are asleep. I'm staring out the window and listening to music. I'm getting mighty sleepy. I noticed something on the side of the other lane that seemed off. On the side of the road there is a sharp hill with a street lamp. I see a black cloaked figure right there facing away from the road and toward a small silo on the top of a hill. I sit up straight in my seat suddenly and watch it before it passes. The figure is just standing there. The street lamp is casting the figure's shadow against the grass of the hill. It is definitely a person. The street lamp above it is bright enough to show the drapiness of its clothes. Drapiness is a word. It seems to have a black cloak or veil draped over its head that reaches all the way down to the ground. The person has their back turned and doesn't move at all. I only get to see it for a few seconds before our car passes it. WTF was that person doing? Wide awake and spooked the rest of the ride home. I doubt it was a statue or a leftover Halloween decoration, because it was such an unappealing and odd position to put one. Cult member. Ghost. All right X, I finally feel like sharing this story that happened to me a few years back. I've got this pre-typed while I was at work and will be posting in blocks. Sit down, strap in, grab a drink, and let me tell you about my experience with the abandoned mine shaft. Be me circa 2017. Out hunting in Nawitz with friend Jay and his girlfriend M. Around noon we decided to call it quits and do some off-roading in the Idaho backwoods. We drive at least another 20 miles back into the woods and are at least 40 miles from anything now. 
look off to the right and see it, two mine shafts with big steel gates blocking them. We get the brilliant idea to check them out. One shaft has a gate that is literally cemented in place. Guess we aren't going there. JPG. The second shaft, however, just has a flimsy rusted chain and lock around the entrance gate. The gate has a bit of a gap in it that's too small for J or I to fit through. M volunteers to squeeze through and see how far back it goes as it curves off about 35 feet in and we couldn't see past that. Hand him my 9mm pistol and a maglite from my jeep and she goes off around the corner. J, Anand, it seems to go back a ways. Our interest is piqued. M squeezes back out of the gap while J and I debate how to get our fat asses in there. Decide to take turns trying to shoot the lock with our hunting rifles. Brilliant dot MP5. Four rounds of third and a six later, technically two because there were misses, the lock shattered. Jay and I go back to the jeep and grab our headlamps, and I decide to duct tape the mag light to my rifle. We all set our timers on our phone for two hours and tell him to wait at the rig and get help if we aren't back in four hours. Everything was good for the first bit. There were some cool icicles forming from the floor up to the ceiling. Roughly 125 yards in, we hit water. Should have turned back there, but nope. We were stupid. Anand. Rock, paper, scissors to see who goes first. Lose. Take point and flip my mag light on for extra light. Water has a really nasty orangish tint and smells like feces, rot, and metal. Shivering in my waders, I pushed forward with Jay covering the rear. Hear what sounds like more sloshing in the water than what we were making. Jay heard it too, so we stand still. Sloshing continues for a minute or so, then stops. I can't see clearly past like 30 feet in front of us, but I swear I saw eye shine. Tell Jay. He responds with, probably just a bat or something anon. If only it were, smile dog. Against my better judgment, I kept going, but Jay and I swapped rifles and he took point. After what seemed like a mile of trudging through thigh deep water, we finally hit dry soil again. Jay and I decided to take a minute to catch our breath and sit down. As soon as our asses hit the ground, both Jay and I heard an echoing voice that sounded like Jay but after smoking a carton of cigarettes a day said it's just a bad anon followed by the most blood curdling. Inhuman, scream I have ever heard. Spaghetti has been lost. Jif. We quickly debated whether it would be faster to go back out through the water, or try and find another way out. We chose wrong. We both decided to try and find an air vent or emergency exit instead. Eventually we come to a crossroads in the shaft. The path going forward is collapsed. What sounds like demonic cackling coming from the left. Decide to go right. Wrong choice number two. The smell of death overtakes us. Fuck that shit. Start heading back for the left path. A third set of footsteps starts coming from behind us. Cackling in front of us continued too. Make it to the crossroads. Jay and I decided that we would try and make them back down by shooting. If you have never shot high caliber rifles in a confined space, do not do it. It hurt and made the world spin. The world is spinning. Loud ass demonic screeching can be heard over the ringing in my ears. Our disoriented asses take off down the left path. Stopped in our tracks by a very tall figure standing in the tunnel. The figure was so tall it had to hunch over in the tunnel. The body was so black it just absorbed the light of our headlamps and flashlights. Neither of us saw its face as its back was turned to us, but to this day it was the scariest thing I have ever seen. From there, Jay and I booked it back to the crossroads. I have never ran faster than I ran through that water. When we got out, neither of us said a word to M. We loaded everything in the jeep and took off back down the trail towards civilization. Since this has happened, Jay and I have just lost touch. I think whatever happened down there changed him. I don't know if he is still with M or not, but I hope they're both doing well. The only reason I decided to post this now is because I recently found another abandoned mine and these memories came flooding back. Eventually I might work up the nerve to go in there and see what's around, but not anytime soon. At least, not till I get some friends who are willing to go with me. Hi, all. First time posting here, but my friend mentioned this would be a good place to get a good read on some weird events that happened to me and my wife a few days ago. I'll start with some background. I am a technical writer and work from home. My wife is a nurse practitioner and works for a health provider. A few years ago, we were looking to buy a house near her family in southern Idaho. Unfortunately, the house we were going to buy burned down. A few months ago, a new opportunity arose and we moved out there in a new house nestled in the woods. 
We are surrounded by forest, and my closest neighbor is a couple miles down the road. While we were moving, one of the movers was an older gentleman. He told me he used to work in a processing plant in the vicinity. We spent a lot of time just shooting the shit and drinking beer. After I paid him, he drove off, but then he turned back around and got out of his truck. He asked me if I hunted or fished, and I said no. Then he asked if I had planned on going into the woods further out. Again, I said no. He told me that I shouldn't go out of my way to hurt anything that wouldn't hurt me if I left it alone. I asked him what he meant, and he said he was just concerned about animals in the forest. Seemed weird. About a week after that, I was mowing my lawn. It was late, maybe five o'clock or something. I noticed something off of our property line that looked like a little chimney. My wife likes artsy stuff, so I thought maybe she had put something out there. Since it was technically off our property, I got up to move it. I realized it was a stack of flat stones, the kind some people landscape their yard with, with damp leaves in between. That was concerning to me, as our house was new and it had not been raining. There wasn't much in the way of explanation. Fast forward two weeks, which would have been this past Thursday. I was in my study writing class when I heard footsteps outside. It's common to hear deer or whatever, so I kind of ignored it. Then, I heard a voice that was not speaking English. The best way I can describe it is this. It sounded like an older man doing an impression of the Tasmanian Devil Looney Tune. Total, crazy gibberish. At this point, I got my gun and headed out back but saw nothing. I didn't know whether to shout or not. My first guess was that it was the old mover, but he was an older dude who had a moving company and lived in town. Then what he said about leaving stuff alone came back to me. I stood outside for maybe 15 minutes, waiting to see what was going on. I moved forward a little bit and briefly put my gun down when a large, round stone flew by my head. I raised my gun, and another flew by. I heard a variety of animal noises I could not recognize, but then everything stopped. The next day, my wife came home from work saying she thought she had heard, weird talking, the night before. Anyone have any clue what could be going on? Anything paranormal? Or am I being pranked? I am new here and very few people know me. Some OC up in this thread. This is what I believe is when my friends and I encounter one shadow person in particular. B16. Paternal grandpa just died, thinking about death and stuff. Get talking about it with my friends one night. Decided that we need to figure out what happens after death. Maternal grandpa was caretaker at the cemetery for forever. And I spent most of my childhood with him there. I suggested that we go there since I know the place like the back of my hand. Try to talk to spooks. Everyone is stoked. We take off. It's about 15 minutes from my place. We go back several times have encounters with minor things, sounds, little kids walking around and laughing. Never felt threatened. One night we're busking around the cemetery when my friend spots something. It's a shadow figure. Six feetish tall and steadily making our way towards us. Lol nope fuck this dot exe. We make our way to the car and GTFO. Everyone's a little shaky and laughing to defuse the situation. Friend who spotted the thing says bro. Something is following us. This is a long ass story. I will put as much info in each post. Get back to the friend's house that we're staying the night at. Everyone is a bit jumpy. But we've calmed down and are ready to move on. Decide we're going to watch the evil dead in the bitchin' projector room. One problem. Blu-ray is out in the car. Fuck. Me and another person decide to man up and go to the car. We get out there and grab the disc. And look up. Fucking shadow person from before is standing under a lamp post. Stepping out of green text for this next bit. This thing is standing under a lamp post. In full illumination. It's dark as fuck and looks like a vague human shape but has disproportionate features. It's shifting back and forth on it. Feet. It's about half a block from us. But it's clearly there. I freeze. Friend with me flies into rage mode. Seriously charges this thing. It fucking pops from one lamp then to another closer about two seconds after my friend charges. He does a mid-run skid and turns tail. We both sprint to the house. 
Get inside and tell everyone what happened. Bricks were shed. Watched some cartoons instead and fell asleep in the same room. Things were quiet for months. But that wasn't the last. This is all circa 2006. Work up the balls to go back to the cemetery. Thing is there. But it doesn't approach us this time. Same feeling of dread. We decide that yeah. There is probably life after death. This shit isn't worth it anymore though. Sometimes we think this thing pops up now and then. Always at a distance so we can be sure. However, the next incident would be dramatic. It's now winter. About eight months since this all went down. It's fucking Idaho. Winter is brutal. Snow finally is melting. 45 degrees feels like 60. Decided to go for a cruise and look at the stars on the dry farms. We were cabin fevering hard. Dry farms are basically 30 square miles of fucking nothing but potato fields so night sky is awesome. Driving out there when this car starts riding my ass. WTF. Slow down so dude will pass. It doesn't. Shit is getting creepy. Decide to turn onto the side road. Go around the block and continue on. Car stops at the head of the road watching us. See in the taillights it's a fucking cop car? Fuck. Look up from the rear view and see the thing standing in the middle of the road with my lights on. Raining piss JPEG. Instinct kicks in and swerves to miss it. Cop obviously saw it too because he fucking whips around and heads back to town hauling ass. In the middle of nowhere potato land and just saw this thing so we all freak out and take off back to town. Feel incredibly drained. Just go back to my friend's house. Dead quiet in the car. We start talking about what happened. If it's the same thing, etc. Decide that this might just be its last hurrah. Stay away from the cemetery as it will go away. Malice feelings sometimes for about a month after. Eventually it fades. Rest of high school we went back to the cemetery twice. Nothing really happens. Had some weird light sightings in the sky. Triangle with lights on each angle. Probably something from the Idaho National Lab and the government. But we don't see the thing again either time we go. Memory fades. Keep in touch with all my friends after graduation. Stepping out of green text again. I keep in touch with all my friends that we had experiences with even now. I moved out of state after graduation. But my job didn't work out so I came back to my hometown to save up and get my ass in school. This was about four-ish years ago. At the time, most of my friends were still in town. One of my friends is getting married real soon. So we're kicking it up before he ties the knot. Mostly just bullshitting around town walking around going down nostalgia lane. Little did we know we would discover the source of the entity. Not expecting it at all while we were wandering around. We live in a college town run by Mormons. Friend who joined the military had his house bought by said college so they could tear it down and build shitty apartments. Pissed as fuck since we hate Mormons anyway. We decide to break into house since it's going to be torn down next week. Reminiscing about all the stuff we did while wandering from room to room. Start to get a creepy vibe. Come on and on, let's get the fuck out of here and go somewhere else. This place is just kinda sad now. As we are leaving, I swear to God that I see a shadow out of the corner of my eye dart across the wall. Brush it off and continue around all our old haunts. Friend notices something. Dude, watch that tree for a bit. See this shadowy head poke around this tree. Fucking Christ. Decide to continue on. This thing actually hasn't done anything anyway. Notice it darting from tree to tree near a park we were walking past. I finally had enough. Turn around and look it in the face. It doesn't have any eyes. You know what? Fuck you. Just fuck off. Didn't notice it after that. Still got the vibe that it was around. Decided to head back to the car and crash at my place. Put two and two together. Figure out this thing was attached to a friend's old house. Playing games online with said military friend. Ask him about it. Says that his dad would bless the house to keep the thing in line about every six months or so. Makes sense. Parents haven't lived there for a while for the thing to be active. Didn't ask what he meant by blessed. Says he was afraid people would think he was crazy. Didn't mention it because of that. Seriously though, we saw this thing all the time and he used that excuse. Fancy ass apartments have long since gone up on that strip of land. Wonder if that thing still hangs around the area? Doubt it. And that is my shadow person experience. TLDR. Things literally followed my friends around for about the space of a year in high school. Years later discovered where it actually came from. 
And it wasn't the cemetery we went ghost hunting in. The hide behind is a mysterious nocturnal creature from American folklore. Considered to be a fearsome critter, it is said to prey upon humans that wander the woods at night, and was credited for the disappearances of early colonial loggers when they failed to return to camp. Early accounts describe hide behinds as large, powerful animals, despite the fact that no one was able to see them. As its name suggests, the hide behind is noted for its ability to conceal itself. When an observer attempts to look directly at it, the creature hides again behind an object or the observer and therefore can't be directly seen. The hide behind uses this ability to stalk human prey without being observed and to attack without warning. Once the person is killed, the hide behind drags the person back to their lair to be eaten. The Bear Lake Monster is a cryptid appearing in local folklore near Bear Lake, on the Utah-Idaho border. The myth originally grew from articles written in the 19th century by Joseph C. Rich, a Mormon colonizer in the area, purporting to report second-hand accounts of sightings of the creature. However, he later recanted the stories. In recent years the monster is considered to be a tourist attraction. The last sighting was reported in 2007. Description The beast of Bear Lake is often described as being at least 40 feet long and with short, but powerful legs. The beast was known to wait for its victims by the shores and then pull them in. It is also known to attack unlucky swimmers in the lake. It is reported as grayish-greenish with the head of an alligator. A man, who appeared in Monsters and Mysteries in America, claims to have seen this monster in 2007. Sightings It goes that he was riding in his boat to go check some fishing lines at night when he heard a growl-like sound. He looked to his right and saw it looking at him. It just went in the water. However, there is the chance that people could confuse the monster with a large alligator. However, this is unlikely due to the fact Idaho is too cold for an alligator. Paddler is the name of the lake monster that supposedly inhabits Lake Pender Ray in Idaho. The lake is said to be the fifth deepest in the United States at almost 1,150 feet, 350 meters, deep in some regions, with a surface area of 148 square miles, 380 square kilometers, and 43 miles, 69 kilometers, long. The creature has been described as over 20 feet long, 6.5 meters, and that it moves up and down in the water as it swims. The first sighting was said to be in 1944, however there were also rumors that the Navy were testing submarines in the lake. In the 1970s more stories appeared about a monster in the lake. In September 1977 a young girl was reportedly attacked by a strange creature near the Sandpoint City Beach. Local journalists called the creature the Pandora Paddler. In 1984, an expedition to the lake by a North Idaho College professor, James R. McLeod. McLeod and his college-based cryptozoological research group conducted a much-publicized investigation, CryptoQuest 84, concluding that a majority of the sightings could have been of a huge, prehistoric looking sturgeon. While collecting testimonies McLeod noted that many people had reported seeing strange things on the lake possibly submarines. The US Navy admitted to using the deep end of the lake for submarine research, albeit many years later. The International Submarine Engineering Group ISC, of Canada also used the lake to test the Pisces I mini-sub in the 1960s. McLeod was able to confirm that the Pisces I was at Pender Ray in 1965. However the story doesn't end there. On Memorial Day, 1985, Julie Green and her friends set out for an afternoon on the lake in the mid-afternoon sun, the teacher from Coeur d'Alene reports, a large V-shaped wave crossed about 200 yards in front of her boat. There was clearly something in the water ahead of us that was undulating, coming in and out of the water, she recalls. Green dropped her engine and gave chase, but the gunmetal gray object, which rivaled the length of her 22-foot boat, soon outdistanced her. Then in 2007 a photograph was published showing something that looked like humps surfacing in the lake. Paddler. The image was taken on March 29, 2007, from Grouse Mountain, Idaho, by the River Journal staff photographer J. Mock and sent to Cryptomando by Surrealist Research Bureau columnist Jody Forrest. The Wapaluzi, Geometry Gradu Celia Attractus, 
is a fearsome critter of lumberjack folklore of North America in the early 19th and 20th century. It was said to have lived in the damp forests in North Idaho by Street Joe River to the Pacific coast. It is the size of a sausage dog and has the feet and toes of a woodpecker. Its tail is also spiked which helps it to climb up trees. The Wapaloozy feeds only on mushrooms that grow on trees and it has become very agile at climbing much like a squirrel. Sightings A lumberjack story tells of how a hunter once shot a Wapaloozy and on investigating the corpse, decided to make a pair of gloves with the Wapaloozy's skin. He tanned the skin and made the gloves with great care with the fur on the outside. But when he put them on to show it to his friends the most bizarre thing happened. When he picked up his axe, the gloves naturally moved by themselves to the top on the axe blade. The man dropped his axe in horror but discovered that whatever he picked up his hands would climb to the top, because they could no longer find a tree. He then discarded the now useless gloves, and the living Wapaloozy gloves were last seen climbing up the logs in the forest. In Fearsome Creatures, 2015, the Wapaloozy is the most innocent and least dangerous out of all the 20 fearsome creatures in his book. However, the rodent is both falsely accused of and indirectly responsible for the Hoquiam Massacre of 1993, one of the worst disasters in Washington's history. Aside from Washington, the Wapaloozy lives in British Columbia in the Pacific Northwest. The Wapaloozy, formerly a mouse, is a chinchilla. The plural term for more than one Wapaloozy is Wapaloosum. The creature's fur has the ability to come back to life even after being killed and sewn to clothing. The Wapaloozy has a spike at the end of its tail that helps climb up trees. The flesh is sour in taste. The Wapaloozy is harmless and adorable, and that it has the lowest fearsomeness level of all of the 20 fearsome creatures in the book, 1. The Wapaloozy has gray rings on its body has two toes on each of its four feet, cat whiskers, cute baby eyes and sometimes, black hair on its head. The scientific name is Adorabilis arborealis. The Wiffenpoof or Gilegaloo fish, Pisces absurdus tumescens, erroneously called Wiffenpoofit, is a large fish notorious for its juicy flesh. They are only found in perfectly circular lakes, hence they are very elusive. But if you do see one, it is said that you should immediately make an attempt to capture one. Catching one is tricky, but it is doable. To capture, row to the exact center of the lake and bore a square hole in the water. Bait the hole with cheese. The best types of cheese that will attract the Wiffenpoof sooner are Stilton, Brie, Liederkranz, or Limburger. Usually, the Wiffenpoof will smell it quickly if you use the listed cheeses, and will come to the surface to feast. When it emerges, Squirt tobacco juice its eye. This will make the creature get so angry that it will not go back into the lake, so you can then easily net it. The Wiffenpoof lives in Idaho, and is the one responsible for defeating and putting the wampus cat to rout, because the Wiffenpoof comes down both sides of the lake at once. Charlie, Slimy Slim, the Twilight Dragon of Payette Lake, is the name given to a reptile-like sea serpent much like the Loch Ness Monster that is believed by some to live in the deep alpine waters of Payette Lake near McCall, Idaho. The first reference to the sea serpent may be the belief of Native Americans, predating western settlement of the area, that an evil spirit dwelled in the lake. The first documented sighting by Western settlers occurred in 1920 when workers cutting ties at the upper end of the lake thought they saw a log in the lake. The log began to move. In August 1944 the serpent was reportedly seen by several groups of people who described it as 30 to 35 feet in length, with a dinosaur-type head and pronounced jaws, humps like a camel, and a shell-like skin. In September 1946 the serpent was reportedly sighted by a group of 20 people. Dr. G.A. Taylor of Nampa, Idaho explained that it appeared to be between 30 and 40 feet long and seemed to keep diving into the water. It left a wake about like a small motorboat would make. In 1954 a. Boone McCallum, editor of the Star News held a contest to name the serpent of Payette Lake. The winning name, Charlie, was submitted by Lyle Hennifer Turi of Springfield, Virginia. In her letter to Mr. McCallum she said, Why don't you call the thing Charlie? You know dash fast you dare, Charlie? 
This was a reference to the popular catchphrase often spoken by Jack Pearl during his old-time radio show. Charlie was reportedly cited dozens of times between 1956 and the last documented sighting in 2002. The Swan Valley Monster made its appearance on August 22, 1868, in the otherwise tranquil locale of Swan Valley, Idaho. Its presence was witnessed and reacted to by an unnamed old-timer crossing the river at Olds Ferry. The first thing he saw of the monster was an elephant's trunk rising from below the surface and spouting water. This was followed by a snake-like head the size of the washtub, with a single horn that kept moving up and down, and long black whiskers on both sides of the face. It had 10-inch long fangs and a red forked tongue that spewed green poison. When it hauled its massive body onto the shore, the old-timer noted that it must have been 20 feet long, and it stank to high heaven. A pair of wing-like fins, or fin-like wings, came out of the sides of its neck. Its forward half was like a snake, the thickness of a calf, greenish-yellow with red and black spots, this in turn led into a fish-like section with hand-sized rainbow scales shining in the sun, finally, the tail was a drab, scaly gray like a crocodile or lizard tail. Shiny black barbed spines, like those of a porcupine, lined its back from head to tail. Finally, it had twelve stubby legs that were easily missed at first glance, the first pair under the fins had hoofs, followed by two pairs of legs with razor-sharp claws, then a pair of hoofed feet, a pair of clawed feet, and another pair of hoofed feet near the tail. Of course, the old-timer's first reaction to the abomination slithering up the bank was to fire a slug into its eye. The monster reared up, hissing, bellowing, and spurting poison over its surroundings, so it got shot a second time in its yellow belly, convulsed, and stopped moving. Everything its poison had touched, whether trees or grass or other living beings, withered and died. As the monster was too large to be carried off by one man, the old-timer returned to town to fetch a wagon and six strapping lads to help him, as well as a tarp to protect them from the poison. They could smell the odiferous creature a hundred yards away, and one of the men had to stay with the horses to keep them from bolting, while another got sick and refused to come any closer. But when they reached the bank where the monster had fallen, there was nothing but withered vegetation and a trail leading to the water. Presumably the Swan Valley monster had crawled back into the river to die, or perhaps it didn't die. Whatever its fate, the old-timer recommended keeping a close watch on the river, as I've hunted and trapped and fished all over the state for nigh on to 75 years, but I ain't never seen nothing to compare with that specimens. Have some shitty MS paint on the side. Early 2000s, move to the Idaho Panhandle. Get cozy in new house, chat with neighbors. Still pretty untamed about 20 years ago, dirt roads, wild dogs, etc. Neighbors warn me of this, they are not strays, they are actually wild. Over time, conversations ease into other topics of things to watch out for. Yeah, and every so often there's UFOs ha. Huh? Wait what? You know, weird stuff flying in the sky. I'm no nut job but. Jesus Christ these rednecks are crazy but don't let it all show at first. A lot of locals admit to seeing a thing or two over the years that they just didn't get, but didn't think too much on it. Surely all bullshit. Skip forward a few years, around 2005. Goofing around with some friends after dark. Hey, the hell's that over the field? Textbook example of triangular three light craft, orange lights, silent. Hey, wouldn't it be crazy if it flew over here and we got a better look? Why did I say this? It banks and start to drift towards us. We book it a few blocks back to my house. Spend a few minutes having a little bit of a back and forth to confirm what we saw. Go look outside, craft drifting away over the fields until it's out of sight. Part 2, short bonus. Relatively uneventful going forward after that. No more weird shit in the sky. Although also not a whole lot of goofing around in the middle of the night for a while. Over the years tons of development occurs, housing projects, roads, etc. Less fun stuff, no more wild animals, fewer lifelong locals, no more, back in my day I saw, stories. Years go by. One day, see a weird dot in the sky. Go out back. A lot of people are out back all pointing and mumbling. You see that? Yeah, we see it. 
Just a weird black orb floating in the sky in broad daylight, it isn't massive but it also isn't small. Completely immobile up there. Suddenly changes from black to metallic slash chrome slash mirror, whatever you want to call it. Zooms off in less than a minute until it clears the horizon. This is from when I was 10 or 12 in North Idaho. Be me. With a friend named Wyatt, best friends since like four but we have since drifted. Trying to build treehouse probably 500 feet in woods behind house, complete guess, it was just too far to see the house so I'm guessing. Property we are building on is not ours, it is a firefighter's where he has a cabin that he virtually never uses. On our way back from dad's shop next to house carrying more plywood. Just kinda wandering cause we were dumb and didn't mark it or anything. Was taking us long ass time to find it, usually found it almost instantly. Come up to fallen tree at entrance to a clearing. Look up. Black silhouette, much taller than us. Didn't stop to take a good look, it was about four feet away so we just ran as fast as possible home. Chalk it up to bear. Wait till father comes home from work to help us find the location. Find it almost instantly. When the white men came here the natives told them three stories, there is a fish in the lake with a human face, there are ghosts on spirit lake, and that there is a second tribe. Second tribe was not like humans, they were bigger, hairy and savage. They lived in the woods. I do not remember the name the natives used cause it's kind of long and not English. There is some decent information about the creatures online, can't find any of it due to not remembering word. I believe that this is what we think of as, Bigfoot, and I believe it is what we saw. Idaho is the scariest place that you have never given a shit about. First off, there are about 1.5 million people in a landmass that's about half the square millage of California. That's not a lot of fucking people. About 90% of the state is wilderness. You could easily hide a body here and it's doubtful anyone would come across it anytime soon if you went deep enough. Few things of the top off the top of my head. There are at least two military caches in the state according to my aunt who works for the Forest Service. She had to visit one while enlisted and has since been back for some reason while being in the Forest Service. She says since WWII the US has hidden caches of arms in the state to be used in a guerrilla warfare campaign if we were ever invaded. Speaking of which, the Idaho National Laboratory is a laboratory federally funded and where the first nuclear power was ever generated to power a city. They keep that shit under lock and key, and there are UFO sightings all the time. My hometown was about 50 miles away from this place, and a wave of silent, hovering triangle UFOs happened a few years back. Most of the time, people would describe them heading from the west, same direction as the INL site. My own UFO sighting which got me interested in the paranormal was part of this flap, and of course it was heading from the west, passed overhead silently and low, and went east towards Wyoming, further on the Idaho National Laboratory. Someone close to me that was former Air Force was driving home through the desert after a trip to the western half of the state. For reference, State Highway 33 runs parallel with the southern border of the Idaho National Laboratory site. For many miles, it's eerie out there, no towns for 30 miles and nothing but sagebrush. He came across this scene that was totally lit up by floodlights when he was right on the border of the Idaho National Laboratory site. He lost a half hour of time, and he only talked to me about this once. I trust his judgment. Continuing from that UFO incident, I became quite the explorer of the paranormal through my late teens. Naturally, I segued into ghost hunting eventually. I've spent a lot of time hunting for ghosts and I can tell you that some places are genuinely haunted. Some are bullshit, and there are many places that are haunted that you would never expect around Idaho. But there is one place I will never go alone, and I doubt I would go period. Little but cemetery is a place not to be fucked with. Typically, cemeteries are places that are pretty peaceful and most stories of hauntings there are horse shit. This place is the exception. It is filled with spirits, mostly mundane, probably people that pass that are lost. I know that there are children's spirits there, or at least something that is very good at mimicking a child. But there is one spirit there that is particularly frightening. He appears as a well-built, vaguely hooded, almost seven feet shadow figure. Unfortunately, my fellow ghost hunter friends and I attracted this thing for a few months. I think it could be a guardian spirit but most likely I think it's a demon that feeds on fear. It followed us for a while, we'd see it standing on street corners and buildings for months. After a while, I think we stopped giving it what it wanted and I haven't seen it in over eight years now thank Christ. Many people have gone to this place to investigate since then, 
I like to feel that I turned into an urban legend of sorts. That thing has become something of a legend. There's many other hauntings through the state, not all I've checked out. Boys as Egyptian theater is extremely haunted, as is the state penitentiary. Near Preston, there was an Indian massacre near the turn of the century and now on the site you can hear crying and sometimes see apparitions. I could go on. But suffice to say that nearly every town has that place or story. Sometimes multiple ones. Next up, satanic rituals and more. Alright boys, I had to take off the other day, but I'm back. I'm sure that you all have figured out that I'm from the eastern half of the state specifically Ricksburg, for whatever reason. East Idaho has tons of reports of satanic or pagan activity, at least since the late 80s. Now I know what you're thinking. That's just a byproduct of the satanic panic, a hokey urban legend because everyone saw Satan everywhere at that time. But the stories keep popping up, and have been for 30 years, at least until the late Zero S. The potato fields and copses on the edge of civilization hide some interesting things to say the least. One example comes from a friend from school. He lived in the fucking boonies, about 10 miles out of town. He came across a group of people, all robed up and chanting. They had literally killed all his cats and had nailed them to a tree. He took a shot at them, and they took off. This guy was a straight shooter, bit of a redneck with not much of an imagination, so I tend to believe. Another anecdote comes from my friend's uncle. We got on the topic one night and he got very somber and proceeded to tell us about his experience. Again, he came across a group in the late 80s, performing some sort of ritual on his property, north of Idaho Falls at the time. He took a running start with a rebel yell to tackle at least one of them and they took off at an inhuman speed. One that he was chasing jumped over a chain link fence in one bound. Either Satan has an Olympian for a homeboy, or something more sinister. You could tell this genuinely scared him, and I knew him very well. He is not a person to fuck around. Stories like this are all over eastern Idaho, of occult groups doing shit in the boonies. It seems a lot of the old timers in town have anecdotes like these ones. So either it's actually happening, or a lot of people are lying. I don't think that many people are lying. I hope that you enjoyed tonight's broadcast. If you enjoyed tonight's story, then please subscribe to the channel as more green texts will appear daily. A new broadcast will appear when the clock strikes midnight central time.